Okay, we want to move on to our next of the pioneers. Um, this is actually number six, right, in our sequence that we've been looking at. We've covered uh, Miller, Bates, Storrs, Byington, and Pierce, and now we want to move on to Charles Fitch. Interesting man. A uh, lot we could say about him. We'll try to cover uh, his material here in an expeditious way. Charles Fitch was born in 1805. Um, he studied at Brown University in Rhode Island, uh, age of 21, 1826, when he was a student there. After finishing there, he served as a pastor of the Congregational Churches in Abington and Hartford, Connecticut, those two places, and in Warren and Boston, Massachusetts, those two places. In 1828, at the age of 23, he was married. In 1832, at the age of 27, he was ordained. And his first work was published in 1835. 1837, at the age of 32, he's publishing an abolition article. Okay, these, these were a lot of our early pioneers and people involved with the Millerite movement were abolitionists. 1838, he wrote to William Miller in March after reading Miller's lectures. Now, let's just put this into context. When, when did Miller begin his public efforts? Remember? 1831. So this is seven years after, after he, he began speaking. Right. Uh, and in fact, when we get to the next uh, gentleman, we'll find out um, who it was that began help Miller to publish his lectures. But these were published by then and Fitch had read them. And he told Miller he agreed with his views, but he held back. And we'll find out a little bit more um, why that was the case. Can you imagine why a, why a minister, a recognized minister, would tend to hold back from something like Miller's views? <laughs> okay, just think about that. Yes, he actually talks about it. He actually says um, that it was the fear of man brought me into a snare. He was afraid of what people would think about, about him. I was unwilling at this time to appear as an advocate of the truth defended by Mr. Miller. He moved to New Jersey, and he became very interested in what is called the holiness doctrine, or basically a teaching of sanctification. In the next year, 1839, age of 34, he published this uh, thing that he had written called Views of Sanctification. And he, at that time, he was pastor of the Free Presbyterian Church in Newark, New Jersey. He, he published this in response to the request of the Presbytery, and that's the ruling body of elders in a Presbyterian church, to explain what he was teaching, because they began to think that he was teaching something that they did not agree with. He, he actually believed that we can have, have freedom from sin. And this is uh, his comment there. And again, this is on the CD-ROM as well. Um, we have in this current collection a collection of, of Fitch's material, which we've included a significant number of his writings. His comment, in this views of sanctification, I have taken this way to lay myself fully open to my brethren and to the world, because I believe it to be in all respects the easiest and the best and do greatly rejoice in the opportunity afforded me to testify to others of the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in me, the hope of glory. So he's wanting to write about the reality of Christ dwelling in you and the life of sanctification, of holiness that you can live as a result of that. That was from his uh, Views of Sanctification, page 4. The next year, 1840, age 35, he's visited by Josiah Litch, a man who we'll look at later on in our overviews. Litch told him he needed the second coming doctrine to add to his doctrine of holiness. In other words, if he was not only preaching live a sanctified life, but was preaching Christ is coming again soon, those two together would, would just really be effective. So, the story is that Litch left him more material to read, Advent, Advent material, Adventist material, and so he restudied the Millerite teaching. That same year, 
in April, he wrote Letter to the Presbytery of Newark. Again, so you can see in his life two things woven together. His interest in sanctification, in living a holy life, in his having to deal with the Presbyterian Church because of the friction it's causing with them, at the same time studying the teachings of the prophecies and the advent of Christ and deciding whether he's going to, to also embrace that. So in this letter to the Presbytery, he makes this um, statement. After being made acquainted with my views and feelings on the subject of sanctification, you have passed a resolution declaring them to be important and dangerous error and admonishing me to preach them no more. I must therefore say, brethren, and I hope to do it with all meekness and humility and lowliness of heart, that I cannot regard your admonition and for the following reasons. So he, he, this, is, this is the letter he's writing a uh, defense of his position. And obviously, um, you can imagine that he no longer remained pastor of that Presbyterian church because of his uh, conviction regarding the subject of sanctification. The next year, 1841, at the age of 36, he joins the Millerites. He, and he published uh, a letter to Reverend J. Litch on the second coming of Christ. The closing words of that letter um, are these. Again, these also are all on the CD-ROM, the entire uh, documents. Mr. Miller, I have never seen but his writings have greatly enlightened my mind, for which I give God thanks, hoping that others may hereby be induced to read and be, as I have been, greatly profited. Yours in the blessed hope of Christ's glorious appearing, Charles Fitch. That letter was published, and attached to it was an address to the reader. In other words, he's publishing his letter that he wrote to Litch, and for everyone to read, and then he's saying, okay, I'm going to add this to everybody else who's reading this letter. And that address to the reader, reader closes with these words, confess him as your Savior now, and he will confess you before his Father and the angels. When he appears, oh, stay not, haste, haste, lest thou be consumed. Look not behind thee, remember Lot's wife. Strong appeal. Strong appeal. Um, also attached to that was a section that he entitled uh, Remarks on the 24th of Matthew. Of course, Matthew 24, again, was Christ's attempt to tell his disciples, uh, here's the signs of my coming, right? They, when he left the temple for the last time, remember in Matthew 23, his parting words was, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And the disciples knew that that was a statement of doom and judgment. It was an indictment, it was a verdict on, on the temple itself and the whole system that was going on there. And so when they got to the Mount of Olives privately, they said to him, uh, actually on the way out, there was one other thing that happened, remember? As they left the temple, they said, look, Master, how magnificent these stones and things are. And he says, not one stone is going to be left on the other. So they knew that it was, a, it was a judgment statement. And then they said to him on the Mount of Olives, what are these things going to be? What, what is the sign of these things in the end of the world? And so Christ then explained to them what they could expect to come with the destruction of Jerusalem. But woven into that was the destruction of the world because those are the two things. Again, if you look at Daniel 8 and Daniel 9 side by side, those cover those very two things. Daniel 8 was given to Daniel, and it was talking about the cleansing of the sanctuary, the restoration of the sanctuary. Daniel's thinking about the sanctuary that was destroyed in Jerusalem in his day. Because he knew that Jeremiah said how many years was left? Seven. Seventy years were left for the des desolations. And he knew that that wasn't that long. It was going to end in his lifetime if, were he to live that long, which he did. But the vision that ended up saying how long, and the answer was what? 2,300. And it's like, how can you put 2,300 with 70? And so Daniel prays this amazing prayer in Daniel 9, in the in the punchline of the prayer at the end it said Lord do not delay <laughs> you know and so Gabriel come and says, comes and says to him in essence Jeremiah's prophecy will be fulfilled it will be rebuilt the commandment will go forth to restore and build Jerusalem and it will be built it will be built in troublous times but it will be rebuilt and in fact the decree to rebuild will be the anchor point for you to know when Messiah is going to come 
But Messiah is going to come, and he's going to come to the to that temple that's restored and rebuilt, right? And that's why it's going to be more glorious than the first, <laughs> Solomon's. And what's going to happen to him? In the midst of that last week of the 70 weeks, he's going to be cut off. Not for himself, but he's going to be cut off. And it, then what's going to happen to the temple in the, in the city? Daniel 9 says it's going to be destroyed again. So basically, Gabriel's telling Daniel, listen, what you're told in chapter 8 is not the picture of your city and your temple. That's the global picture. But here's what's going to happen to your city and your temple. And so when we come to the New Testament, that's exactly what was taking place. The disciples were concerned about. They thought the destruction of Jerusalem was going to be the end of the world. And Christ basically weaves the two together. Um, but Daniel 8 is the end of the world. Daniel 9 was the end of Jerusalem in the New Testament time. You had a question? When you just said that, it, it, it's amazing. It rang with something I've been reading in the Old Testament. Whenever the people were cut off from their people, they, yeah. they had no hope of eternal life. That's right. They, they, um, you know, that That's right. Was, that meant their eternal destiny. Exactly. The, and you come across that phrase quite a bit you know, right. in the books of Moses. You know, That's right. Cut off. And, and so that really speaks of the time of death, the Jesus of the died. Of the right, yes. right. He wasn't coming to reign on earth. He was coming to be cut off. Yes. So the idea of being cut off, speaking about uh, a, a death of abandonment from God, mm -hmm. no hope of eternal life. And that's how it is used throughout the Old Testament. So that's what Gabriel, Gabriel was saying to him there. So again, it's significant that we're going to Matthew 24. Because in Matthew 24, we have these local, the local destruction and the global destruction paralleled. We're woven together. First chapter in, in Great Controversy, entitled The Destruction of Jerusalem. She said it's the type of the end of the world because that's exactly... The process of judgment and destruction always follows a pattern. And we've looked at that before. You know, the three phases of judgment, the investigation, the verdict and sentence, and the execution of the sentence. And it's always following the same principles as well. 1841, back to our man Charles Fitch. Uh, June 20th, 1841, he's 36 years old, he preaches a sermon, the power of the gospel, to show that it saves, not just from hell, but from sin as well. Again, this is the basis of the doctrine of sanctification, right? He's come to save his people from their sins. 1842, at the age of 37, he's led, you can imagine, he's led to think of a better way to convey the concepts of the prophecies. And with Apollos Hale, he produces the 1843 chart. Now, this is not a very big re reproduction of it, but you might uh, recognize the, uh, the way it's outlined there. It was much larger than this, and of course, back then, I think they were actually reproduced on fabric. But this was the 1843 chart. You can see it's a modern, uh, um, the modern version of this would be a, a PowerPoint <laughs> picture, but this was, a, this was their graphic that they had back then. And they would hang the chart up and give their lectures. Starting um, with the, the Daniel 2 uh, image, and then the other beasts represented in the prophecies of Daniel, the dates, uh, the times of, of the prophecies listed there as well. And you can see the, the year that it, that it leads to here. What is it? Can you see it? 1843. That's why it's called the 1843 chart. This chart was used extensively by the Millerites. It was very effective at helping people to visualize the interpretation of the prophecies. That same year, he published The Glory of God in the Earth, which explains that God's oath in Numbers 14.21, have you ever looked at that oath of God? Numbers 14.21. Let's, let's not skip over this without looking this up. If you have your Bible, you might want to open to that. This is an amazing prophecy in the Old Testament. It's Moses um, interceding for God's people and the Lord speaking. What is Moses interceding for? Israel has refused to enter Canaan. Right? Mm -hmm. And what has God said, uh, let me do? Yes. Let me just uh, do away with this people. I will strike them. Doesn't hear them. I'll make of you a nation greater. And Moses intercedes because he has the spirit of Christ, you know, identifying with the sinners, wanting them to be saved. And in verse 20, God says, I have pardoned them according to your word. 
But truly, this is the oath in verse 21, as I live, when God says that, that's an oath. Truly, as I live, the, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. What an amazing statement. And so he writes an article on the glory of God on the earth and explains that that will be fulfilled at the second coming. Not by some universal conver con conversion of the world. Okay? In other words, it's when Christ comes down. And so the, he used this, this text to focus on the Advent teaching. I would say let's keep that in mind as we look toward the uh, era of Minneapolis because it becomes clear after the passing of the time. This is still before the, the time passed, right? It becomes clear after the passing of the time that the prophecies pointed to a time when the antitypical Day of Atonement would begin and there would go forth a message to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And what would this message teach? The gospel of the kingdom, right? The gospel of the kingdom. And what is the gospel about? The glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord. And clearly, it's a, it's a picture that we get when we look at the light that came to them after the passing of the time, that it's not just Christ coming to this earth that's going to fill the earth with glory, but there's a message that's going to go to the world conveying the gospel in an end-time setting, powerful message. In the language of Revelation 18, the earth is filled with the glory of this message. And so that's actually the preparation for Christ's coming. That calls the people out of Babylon. They come to the light, and they actually are willing to, to follow that. So that's um, an interesting thing they did. Then he published another article entitled, A Wonderful and a Horrible Thing, 1842. And I... I just extracted a few things um, from that, giving you an overview of what it was. He, he's quoting here. This is from Jeremiah 5, verses 29 to 31. This is the, where he got the, the title for this article. Shall I not visit for these things, saith the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? A wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their means. And my people love to have it so. And what will ye do in the end thereof? Have you ever read that passage? Now again, Jeremiah, chapter five. Chapter five. Yeah, uh, Roman numeral V. That's how they wrote five in those old times. <laughs> they use Roman numerals for the chapters, and they use Arabic numerals for the verses. You'll find that frequently in the old writings. Um, again, let's just look at the parallel. Jeremiah was a prophet that lived when? At the fall of Babylon. I mean, at the fall of Jerusalem. Exactly, at the fall of Jerusalem. He was an end time prophet in that sense. He was a prophet at the time where God's judgment came upon not the world, but the city. Okay? Again, but the, the falls of these cities, Jerusalem and Babylon both, are types of the end of the world when the whole world will, will suffer this. And what are, the, what are the things that are happening? The things Jeremiah is seeing, Jer the things that Jeremiah is describing, are things that you can expect to happen again on a global scale. And in fact, if you read Jeremiah carefully, it's clear as the Spirit inspired him to write about destruction. He's seeing not only the destruction of Jerusalem, but he's seeing the destruction of the world as well. He's seeing you know, the whole earth desolate. Now, a lot of the a lot of the prophecies that we uh, used to describe like the, the earth under the millennium, we take from Jeremiah. That wasn't a picture. It didn't happen in Jeremiah's day, but he was given. You know, the Holy Spirit blends these things together, the local and the global, because they're parallel. Not in scale, but in type and in, in dynamics. Well, yes. I have a comment. Yes. I was looking to my papers today, mm -hmm. and it talked about uh, God's plans for hospitals and schools. Yes. It has to be connected with a agricultural work. Yes. I was just reading it this week as well. And, and it, what it struck me the most is when he said God's plans. Right. So when I see like this mm -hmm. institution, mm -hmm. it's not following God's mm -hmm. plans. Well, often, as in the times of Jeremiah, we get sidetracked, but God calls us back. 
the words of, the, uh, of this plan is still there. The message of the prophets are still there. And uh, I was thinking about that quite a bit just recently because I'm, I was passing by here in this area where they had done some recent uh, uh, landscaping. And they're planting a lot of stuff, but none of it's edible. I'm thinking, why couldn't they just plant fruit trees, you know, rather than these ornamental trees? Why couldn't they have, you know, anyway, this, is, this, this area grows so much things abundantly. Um, but again, there's some practical issues there that we could consider. But let me, let me show you. This is, uh, he's quoted Jeremiah now, and then he says, the object of this discourse is to show the application of the foregoing text of sacred, sacred scripture to the existing state of things in the professedly religious world. Number one, <laughs> the prophets prophesy falsely. We, the New Testament talks about false teachers. Same type of thing. Okay? Number two, the priests bear rule by their means. Okay? In other words, it's a monetary job for them, not a spiritual office. Can we put it that way? Number three, the people love to have it so. God gives you what you want. So be careful what you want. Okay. And then number four, what will you do in the end thereof? In other words, do you see where this is headed? <laughs> do you see what's coming? In Jeremiah's day, it was the destruction of, of Jerusalem. In our day, what is it? It's, the, it's a global destruction. Okay. And that's why the, the second angel's message in Revelation 14 says Babylon has fallen. And it's repeated in 18 and, and the messages come out of her. Okay. Come out of her. 1843, the following year, age of 38, he preached and published a sermon entitled, what? Come out of her, my people. And here are the four parts to it. Number one, what is Babylon? Number two, are, what are we to understand by the fall of Babylon? Number three, what is, it, what is it for God's people to come out of Babylon? And number four, what will be the consequence of refusing to do it? It's very interesting in the um, issue that we published on Charles Fitch here in, in Lest We Forget, volume two, number three, um, we had an insert. And this insert was uh, published in the Centennial Special of the Review and Herald, 1944, 100 years after 1844. And it has this graphic. I don't know whether you can see it here. Um, see the three links in the chain? Who's, who's in the first link? Miller, first angel's message. Who's, who's in the second link? Fitch, second angel's message. Babylon has fallen. And then we haven't gotten to the last one yet, but who's in the last one? Can you see? James White. James White, with a chart that says the law of God, preaching the third angel's message. So there's, there's the uh, links in the chain. And this was written by F.D. Nichol who was at that time the associate editor of the review, who wrote quite a bit on Adventist history. Uh, his, his material was very useful on Adventist history. Um, but again, three links in the chain, first angel's message, second angel's message, third angel's message. Um, and the man we're looking at right now, he's right in the middle there. Second angel's message, come out of her, my people. December of 43, he's 38 still. These people had a lot of other things going on in addition to the, the work for the, for the Lord. They had family problems, family issues. And then here he wrote and published, later published a letter to Brother Himes on the death of his son, Willie. Listen to this. See if it moves your heart. This day I would lay in the grave my dear Willie, a little boy that would have been seven years of age, the 15th of the present month. Ten days before he's 70, he dies. I need not tell you that my heart aches. And I cannot tell you how much. Some ten months ago, he took an inflammatory rheumatism, which left him with an organic disease of the heart. He was comfortable through the summer and went east with us. He kept about until the last of October. While I was absent at the time, he was prostrated, bedridden. On my return, the physician said there was no hope of his recovery. Oh, how my heart was pained at the prospects of seeing his life wrung out of him with anguish, of then following him away to the cold grave. I stood and watched by his side three weeks, held him in my arms to relieve his distress, and sung to him at his oft-repeated request the second Advent hymns 
to beguile his tedious hours. Sing to me, Pa, was his repeated request every hour. What shall I sing, my dear? Sing, how long, O Lord, our Savior. And again, sing, lo, what a glorious sight appears. Sing, my faith looks up to thee. After three weeks, I thought he might live. For weeks to come, and feeling it to be to be duty, I tore myself away from his side with an aching heart and went last Monday to Huron County to preach the kingdom of the Lord on Sabbath morning last. Being in Fairfield, more than 60 miles from home, I was awakened from my pillow by a messenger who said, your son, your child is dead. I hastened home and we have just laid him in his lowly bed. It has been painful, painful. But the Lord sustains us, but we have hope in his death. What did he think was going to happen in just a short while? Christ would be here and the dead would rise, right? It may, it's still painful to see, you know, a child suffer and die. Yes, yes, it's his son, seven-year-old son. And if you look carefully at the details of his life, you know, we, we don't have room on, on one piece of paper to cover much. He actually lost another child at this time. In the same way? I, mean, I don't, yes, due to infectious, usually it's infectious disease at this age, you know, infectious childhood diseases that killed a lot of children in those, in those days. Um, February of the, of the next year. February of 44. He's 39. Two of his letters of this date were published in the Midnight Cry, March the 14th. From the first, he states this. Our dear brother Stores, remember him? This gentleman here, right? Our dear brother Stores says, and bro, what, what was Brother Stores noted for in his, uh, his contribution? He had written on what? Uh, right. The non-immortality of the wicked. <laughs> How that uh, you believe that uh, you don't really stay alive after you die. I do another story. It says that the great head of the church designed that we should come out of Babylon and not wait for Babylon to thrust us out, <laughs> like the, you know, like the Egyptians did. Sometimes you can take your wrong Bible story to apply to yourself. I believe he is right, and I am therefore determined to come out. Subsequently, to my being separated from the Newark Presbytery. I was induced at the solicitations of several clergymen to unite with the New York Congregational Association and was received by that body and became a subscriber to its creed, having also been received by the General Association of the Western Reserve. Western Reserve, um, we didn't make it clear here, but he had moved to Ohio and he traveled all over the state of Ohio preaching this Advent message. This is where, this is where his son died. The Advent message. Advent. No, they, don't, they didn't have the Sabbath at this point. No. From his second letter that he had published in the Midnight Cry, he, he makes these observations. My wife and myself recently have been buried with Christ by baptism. Well, let's just pause there. He's been raised a Christian, pastoring churches. But at this point, in 1844, he and his wife are buried in baptism. That means they were never died. by immersion, okay? But we need to we need to become aware of this. Later on, we may mention it. There were times in evidence history where people were rebaptized by immersion because they came to a new understanding of of truth. Um, so that's that's something that we can understand better as we look at history. She's, he says, having received that presence ordinance at the brother, hands of Brother Cook, I have since baptized about 30 in Cleveland and eight in Painesville. Most of them have been members of churches. Brother Pickens and his wife and a large number of the church have also been baptized. A state of things among his people is truly delightful. They are a happy band looking without wavering for the coming of the Lord. We have much more opposition to contend with than we had a year ago, but we do not forget that which he endured. But we do not forget that he which endureth unto the end shall be saved. And that opposition is the very thing which we are called upon to endure. So again, actively spreading the message of the soon coming of Christ, baptizing people, 
with their new understanding. Christians who may have never had the immersion baptism, but maybe even those who had and just really wanted to be rebaptized again. This concludes with, this letter concludes with the following. My whole being cries out, Come, Lord Jesus. Take thy great power and reign. I tremble in myself when I think of meeting him that trieth the reins of the heart. Still I know that I love his appearing and feel a confidence in his mercy that he will not cast me out. Yours in the blessed and glorious hope, Charles Fitch. Where was his, uh, where was his confidence? In his mercy. In his mercy. Not in his doctrine of holiness. <laughs> Not in the sanctification that he taught, that you can be free from sin. His confidence was in God's mercy because he knew that only he can, you know, supply that which we need to have a title to heaven, right? He may be giving me a fitness for heaven, but that's not my title. The title has to be free and clear, right, <laughs> of any taint, and all of us have, have taints. Did he live to see the passing of the time? No. Amazing story, huh? October, the very month that they were finally came to uh, expect Christ to come. By the way, they had their first disappointment the spring of 40, 44 when that Jewish year passed. And we don't get into the details of what happened that summer where they came to an understanding of the seventh month, October of that year. And, uh, but they were looking for that, that time. And again, it's fall, right? <laughs> it's October. And they're not in the south, they're in the north. And he's baptizing people in water. Okay? And he gets chilled. And he gets sick. And on the 14th, eight days before the passing of the time, he dies. But the story is amazing. Uh, that's pictured there of, of what, what he's doing. Let me just read it, read it to you here. Charles Fitch became seriously ill, probably with pneumonia, in the month of October, 1844. He had chilled while baptizing converts. On Monday last, Brother C. Fitch was yet very sick in Buffalo. His life was despaired of. On hearing Brother Storr's article in the seventh month, read, again, this is uh, the uh, same Brother Storr's, but he's writing about the seventh month, which is October. He, Brother Fitch, shouted glory several times, said it was true, and he should be raised to proclaim it. So we have just been informed. Soon we hope our afflicted brother will enter that land where the inhabitants will not say, I am sick. Continuing another account of the time. Brother Judson informs us that he found Brother Fitch at Buffalo barely alive. His soul, however, was full of hope and glory. He said that it was indelibly written upon his soul that the Lord would come on the tenth day of the seventh month. And if he went into the grave, he would only have to take a short sleep before he should be awaked in the resurrection morn. So not only his sons, his ch children that died, but he obviously facing it now himself. Evidently, Brother Judson visited Fitch prior, on or prior to October 14 when he actually died. The next midnight cry to be published was October 31, 1844, because none was published during the week of the disappointment, and that issue contained his obituary. And let me just read that here. This dear brother has fallen asleep in Jesus. Those lips from which the words of God have been poured forth with power upon so many thousands of listening ears are now sealed. That heart, which beat with a father's tenderness and a brother's love for the children of God, has ceased beating. After his arduous labors at Morrisville and St. George's camp meetings, he left New York for Cleveland on Monday, September 16. At Rochester, while apparently in perfect health, he stated in a public meeting that he had a presentiment that he must sleep a little while before the coming of the Lord. On arriving at Buffalo, he was attacked with a severe bilious fever and died on Monday, October 14, in full faith that he should awake in a few days in the likeness of his Redeemer. Yes, just 39 years old. Very, very young man. Are you aware of what Ellen White wrote about him? Yes, yes I'm sorry. She, she said that um, he was one that he, the Lord laid in the 
grave so he could save them. Yes. Ellen White wrote, this is the next paragraph I was going to read, Ellen White wrote regarding Brother Fitch's early death that God had laid him in the grave to save him and that while in vision she had met him at the tree of life in heaven. Early writings, page 17. Yeah. I want to write that down but there somewhere. Why is to save him? Because he will not have been able to go for this appointment. Could have been that or maybe uh, he would have not accepted the third angel's message and would have fallen out because of that. Uh, we don't not give him the details as to uh, why he needed to be saved. Early writings, page 17, according to the reference here. There's somebody else she says that out too. Stockman. Okay. She met Brother Stockman and Fitch at the Tree of Life. And both of them yes. were put in the grave to be saved. Yeah, I, believe, I believe both of them had been laid to rest before the, the time there, yes. That same idea, to be saved. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they inquire about, didn't they inquire about their trials they've gone through? And, yeah, right. What happened since we were laid to rest? And, and, you know, they had a hard time recounting the, the, the difficulties that were there. Any observations about this gentleman? Amazing man. Yeah, like you say, young man. Died young, but the Lord used him powerfully to preach. And to baptize was effective at thinking of a, of a visual way. Of, of writing the vision and making it plain that he can run who reads it. Remember Habakkuk 2, the passage there? <clears throat> That's, that was their mandate for this. Now you can see why some of us like to put these things in tables and diagrams and <laughs> uh, outlines because it really helps to get a picture of what's going on in Martha. Are you that his wife, did she stay in the church? Um, there is an article in here, if you're wanting to do that, there's an article on, her name was Zerviah, Z-E-R-V-I-A-H. Okay, and uh, I'll, I'll just read here if you're interested at the uh, end of this here. Within one year's time, three of her close family died. First, seven-year-old Willie in December of 43. Then her 20-month-old baby boy in January of 44. Finally, her husband himself in October 14, 1844. His powerful, uh, convincing voice would be laid in the dust just eight days before the anticipated coming. But when she di Charles died, she and her remaining children were consoled by the thought there was but a short time before Christ would come together, the scattered members of the family. Brother Williamson reported that she was at the funeral without a tear, expecting to meet her husband very soon. So, far from sorrow, she is smiling and happy. In December of 44, the Midnight Cry published a short letter Zariah wrote in closing a poem by her friend, a sister Jane's. The poem expressed, as she said, my own thoughts and feelings, and contained in the first verses words in bold, often preached by her husband. Well, you, you can't see the bold when I'm reading here, but here's, here's the words of the, of the first verse. The blessed Jesus loves to claim the purchase of his blood, to take us for his own and make our hearts his loved abode, to take away our dross and tin and make us, all, make us glorious all within. So that's the comments about her. I don't have any more information on her other than that. But, um, she obviously was a woman of faith. And uh, I assume that she kept that faith to the end of her life, too. Any other observations on, on this man? We can thank him for his contributions on the doctrine of sanctification and on the contribution to the 1843 prophetic chart and his willingness to take a stand on the Advent message.